Our discovery class 
which is our foundations class. If you want to know what we believe as a church, the foundations of what this church was built on, then this class is for you. It's beginning next week. Say next week. Nine o'clock. I don't know where yet, but there's a sign up in the back. If you sign up, you will find out where we're going to have that class. It's probably going to be downstairs in the Ed Wing somewhere. It's going to be an incredible, incredible course. If you're ever wondering what we think, what we truly believe, what our foundations and core beliefs are here at King's Fire, then this discovery course is for you. If you want to understand worship, if you want to understand giving, baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues, this class is for you. It is a deep dive and discipleship class into the foundations of our beliefs. So that's next, starting next Sunday at 9 o'clock. Also next Sunday, <laughs> baptisms. <laughs> if you have never been baptized, if you have been baptized and you want to be baptized again, if you were baptized last time and you want to jump in the tank, you can do it. There is no biblical verse that says you can, oh, you can only be baptized once. So, okay, I'm the only one excited about this, but if you would like to be baptized, please, there is another sign up at the Welcome Center. Make sure your name is all, and all the pertinent information is on there. If you've never been to a King's Fire baptism, you're in for a treat next week. We're going to have a party. You think today is going to be kicking. Next week, there's nothing like a baptism at King's Fire. <laughs> right? <laughs> So baptisms, I'm so excited. I'm excited about today. I'm excited to see you all. I just bless you in the name of Jesus. All right, let's stand. Our, our choir has gone from large to extra large. You're in for a treat. <laughs> it's going to be good. Father, we thank you. We praise your name. We worship you. There is none like you, none worthy of praise as you are, none so holy as you are. There is no greater name than you, Jesus. There is no greater act than the death and resurrection that you performed on this earth so long ago. And we stand as testimony of that victory because without that victory, we would not be here. Father, this is not just some behavior modification class. This is the power of the Holy Spirit at work on the earth today as we bring the kingdom down on earth and in earth as it is in heaven. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Let our worship this morning be in spirit and in truth as we give it all and we lay it down. In Jesus' name, amen.
to send the children to Sunday school. You may be seated if you can. Woo, good job, kids. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! So glad you are here to experience moments like this with us. Wouldn't you know the Lord does not want our walk with Him to just be high moments like this, but He desires it to be a walking, living, breathing relationship where moment by moment we sense and understand His presence and His love for us and His desire to use us. Anybody think this world needs to see some love? Needs to see some power? Resurrection variety of power? To be able to know that there is a God, to know that He is not in a tomb somewhere that we have to try to find a way to get to, and just hope that it's in a country that allows for visitation, but rather we serve the living God, the living Savior, the risen Savior, the one who was dead, but He's not anymore. <laughs> I hope you can sense His aliveness this morning. Because he is faithful to his word. And what he has said he will do, he will do it. What he has promised to fulfill, he will fulfill it. Because he's not a man that he should lie. He's the living, breathing God, creator of this universe. And I hope that your heart is expanded this morning in worship and in this piece of the calendar where we remember that Jesus is risen. That he's risen. That he's risen. That statement is so powerful that if you dare to believe it, the Bible says that if you believe that the Lord raised him from the dead and you say that, you'll be resurrected too. The beautiful thing of the resurrection is it wasn't just for Jesus. It was for every single person who would dare and have the audacity in the face of the scorn of this world to believe that truth. That the grave is not empty because his disciples stole the body the way that the first guards were paid by the religious leaders of the time to spread that message. They were paid cash money to spread a message that the disciples came and took his body. But if you've touched the presence of Jesus, or rather I should say if his presence has touched your life, then you know that the disciples didn't steal the body from that tomb on resurrection morning. Yes, now an angel came down and moved the stone away to reveal that the son of the living God could not stay dead. That death could not hold him. And not only that, death couldn't even hold on to the keys that were attached to death's belt. Because when Jesus came out, he brought the keys with him and he gives them to, do you know who? The church. He gives them to you if you are one of his. And that's why we can celebrate, that's why we can worship, that's why we can clap and understand that we actually have an authority over the enemy, not because we did something great. Religion teaches us that if we perform well enough, we might have access to some of the goodness of our God and some of his attributes and abilities, whereas Jesus said, all you have to do is believe and receive the free gift of salvation. There's such freedom in Christ. I hope that you sense his freedom this morning. It's just hard for me to even... Just stand here and compose my thoughts because they aren't fully mine, <laughs> which is a good thing. My thoughts can only get us so far. Who here had good thoughts for your life and they got you so far? And then you realized you needed someone's thoughts that were beyond your own to get to where you could see the light again. Most of man's thoughts lead us into greater darkness. But I can promise you, when you follow the light of the resurrected one, he leads you into a life that's not just enough for you. There's an abundance of it, enough for those that are in your family and in your job and in your school. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the beautiful thing about the resurrection. It wasn't just so that Jesus could one up his arch enemy, the devil. It was so that he could share. We're going to look at some scriptures today that verify what I'm saying so that you don't think that I'm just saying this out of my own personal experience, although we could go around this room and have testimonies shared that would verify what I'm saying. But the word of God tells us what he's going to do. Did you know that about the word? Did you know that every time the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached by the first preachers of that message, do you know what the first thing they did when they began to preach that message was? They went back to the prophets of old who had spoken God's word and written it down so that they could understand that the message they were bringing in the present was a message that God had already spoken and promised to fulfill, though it took centuries, in some cases almost a thousand years, to be fulfilled, yet his word was fulfilled. I so appreciated the message that uh, Pastor Chris's wife, Carrie Politillo, shared last Sunday. As I listened to it, I realized how everything that we believe only has weight to it provided that it's grounded in the Word of God. Every other thing can just be a great idea, and it might be a wonderful idea, and it might seem like it's got great promise to it, but it won't touch this world the way that the Word of God will touch this world, because He watches over His Word to perform it and to complete it in the ears and hearts of those who receive it by faith. We're going to read a little bit of the, of the story. You can find the resurrection story and the story of the what the what's been called the passion of the Christ, that piece of time where he, our Savior, Messiah, faced down the hordes of the enemy and seemed to have lost at the hand of angry men and even the devil. And yet we discover on resurrection morning that they only thought they had won, but they actually had not. And we're going to look at Matthew 27. You can read the story in different Uh, parts of the different gospels, the four gospels, but I wanted to read in Matthew 27, and I'm going to do my best today to try to read as much scripture as I possibly can and to let that speak to your heart, because I've just been re-challenged that so much of what we see happening in what's called popular church churchianity, whatever you want to, what makes great sermons and podcasts, if you have too many scriptures, they'll say, well, if you have too many scriptures, you're going to lose the people. And I'm like, wow, if that's not just the breath of demonic influence right there alone, what else could it be? It is the word of God that is sharper and and, and just has that ability to get to the point in our lives that can transform us. And wouldn't it be just like men to believe, well, if we don't mix in enough good stories to make it relatable, then it'll just go over people's heads and they won't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save them. I can't think of a, a more obvious fraudulent statement than that one. And so I'm going to do my best today to let the Word of God speak to us. What's so clearly written needs no exaggeration, it needs no amplification, it just needs belief. The gospel has power the moment you believe it. That's all it takes. If you came to church, maybe you're what we call a CEO, a Christmas and Easter only, a CEO of the faith. I keep saying it, every time there's a Christmas or an Easter service, I say, just to see if everybody's tired of it like I am, but no, there's still always, there's always a giggle, so either you're hearing it for the first time or you still think it's funny, I don't know. (laughs) But we may have a few CEOs with us today, and so it's important that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the simple, beautiful, elegant, powerful, profound design of God the Father, the Creator, to redeem a fallen planet is able to be heard in this room this morning because it is the power of God unto salvation. It's not just part of it, it is it. And as soon as you try to add anything to it, you're going to miss the power that's embodied within the message of what the gospel actually is. And we'll go to Matthew 27. We'll just read in verse 45. It's the moments before Jesus finishes his work of sacrifice on the cross. And in Matthew 27, verse 45, I'll read this in the New King James Version. You can follow along if you'd like. And it says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out 
with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a direct quote from Psalm 22, where David, the psalmist, wrote almost exactly what would happen to Messiah centuries later. It's an incredible study. If you have doubts about the validity of the Word of God, just read Psalm 22 and then go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just go to the end and read the account of the crucifixion of Christ and you realize God told in advance what He was going to do and He always does it that way. As soon as someone who was going to preach the gospel began to preach, they referenced what had been spoken by God already, knowing that He will fulfill the words that He speaks. Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone and let's just see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. We know from other accounts of this passage, that's the moments where he said, he said, it's finished And then he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. Those were the last words that Jesus says from the cross. It's finished. And he yields up his spirit to the Father of spirits, God the Creator. And they said, leave him alone, see if Elijah comes. And Jesus cries out again and says, then at that moment, He yields up his spirit, and then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And so when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, They feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. A point I want to pull from this, there's so many things we can look at in this piece of Scripture, and we'll continue to read on through the resurrection, but there's a reality that when heaven's glory comes to earth, earth responds. Most of the accounts that we read, there was an earthquake. The earth doesn't know what to do, so it just begins to tremble under the presence of heaven when it comes down to earth. But something else happened in that moment when Jesus said it was finished and he he yielded his spirit back to the one who had given it to him. The curse of sin was broken on planet earth. And even the rocks themselves, if there's one thing we know about rocks, if you have any background in biology or geology, rocks are dead. Some of them maybe once were composed with some, you know, they were mixed in with some living things. We have fossil rocks, but a rock is dead. It's fully dead. And yet even the rocks, the dead part of earth even still responds. The earth itself, the ground, the crust, whatever, begins to shake often when when God sends an angel or when Jesus comes or the Holy Spirit is in a place, it says that the building would begin to shake. Man, I don't know, this morning with those children singing and just, I thought, whoa, I was like feeling for it, seeing that. I don't think we'll have to like feel for it and see if it's shaking. I think when God begins to shake our lives, there's a, there's, we know it's happening. And it'd be cool if he shook this building. We could use a, a bigger one. So just, just hopefully it doesn't shake it too hard while we're in it, okay? Okay, Lord, just try to work that out. We're happy to show up on a Sunday morning and see it. Well, the daycare wouldn't be happy. So we got to be careful how we say this, but... It might be the price of improvement, you know, we got to shake up the old and just shake it enough so that we get the point to, I'll just leave it there because it's only going to get, in my mind telling me it's going to get better if you keep going in my mind, there's a part of me that's learned that that's probably not true. <sighs> Pastor wants the building to fall down, huh? Uh, going back to that church. <laughs> <laughs> we'll lose all the CEOs for sure. <laughs> when heaven's glory comes to earth, there's a response. Paul and Silas worshipped in prison and the earth began to shake because he inhabits the praises of his people. 
An angel shows up to Peter in prison and his chains fall off. The earth shakes when Jesus is on the cross finishing his work. It's also the reason that the guards shake at the tomb when the angel of the Lord shows up. But let's continue reading in Matthew 27. It says, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, This piece of scripture is so interesting to me. Because the Pharisees and priests of the religious elite were the ones who insisted on Jesus being crucified. We would think that those who claimed God as their father, the object, the person of their worship, would have recognized Messiah, but they didn't. And they actually were the chief instrument in getting Jesus crucified in the first place. And even after they watched the brutality of his crucifixion. If we read other accounts, we discover he was mocked. They gathered around. They put a sign over him, the king of the Jews, just to needle him and say, hey, if he's really anybody, let him come down and let God save him. Let's see if Elijah comes. There was just this sarcastic, bitter treatment of Christ. And yet, he stays through to the end. And his, his accusers, the, false, the ones that falsely accused him and the, the bitter religious cult of that day, the Pharisees were in charge of that. They came together to Pilate. Now, Pilate was a Roman officer. He worked for the Roman government. He was not a Jewish person. He was not a religious leader. He was the government representative in the story of Christ. And they go before him because they were under Roman control, and they had to you know, get approval from local governance to get things done, like the execution of Christ was done by the Romans, but it was put forward by the Jews, by the Pharisees of the Jews. Not all Jews, obviously. Many of them worshiped and loved Jesus. And they say this, they say, sir, we remember that while Jesus was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Now pause for a moment and just point this out, because we learn from later on in the story when, you know, as Carrie was talking last week, that some of them were walking away from Jerusalem. Jesus had to walk on the road and say, hey guys, didn't you hear what's going on in the, you know, didn't you remember the things that you were told? And he had to open up from the scriptures the story of how Messiah would come and what would happen and suddenly reveals that he's now been resurrected. But they were so slow of heart was the word that she kept using. They were slow of heart to believe and to understand the words that Jesus had spoken. And here we see the enemies of Jesus, the ones who insisted that he be removed from society because his messages were too dangerous, the people were following him, his miracles were allowing people to see that God apparently even loved sinners and those who they had written off as too uh, evil to be considered part of God's children. And they come before the government and they say, hey, listen, we know we got him like executed. They all witnessed it. They saw him go into the ground, but they said, you know what could still happen? He said, in three days, I will rise. Therefore, let's command. They said, can we command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead. And so the last deception will be worse than the first. It's amazing to me that the critics were more on top of what Jesus had been talking about and his disciples somehow it went right over their heads. Think about that for a minute. Is it possible that for those of us who are we're blood-bought, we believe in Jesus, we've received him, they, I mean, these guys had walked with him, they've experienced his miracles for three years, they've, they've, they've seen Lazarus come out of the tomb, they've seen people raised back to, to life, sick people healed, blind people seeing. Is it possible that having seen all that, they, their ears were still dull, their heart was still slow to believe, and therefore their enemies and the ones who were against Christ, anti-Christ, were more aware of his plan And we're trying to make sure that they had done all that they could to circumvent the fulfillment of Jesus' words. Even more so than his own disciples were actually listening to what Jesus was saying. Herein lies, I believe, the greatest dilemma that we face in the last days on planet earth. Are we fully aware of what Jesus has already told us is about to happen? Are we even invested to finding out? He does nothing unless he shows it and tells about it, and yet we kind of wait, like, what's going to happen next? Why would we do that? We know exactly what's happening next. We understand exactly the cosmic struggle of good versus evil. We know exactly. We don't know the time 
But we have every detail that is required for us to live a life of preparedness and excitement as we look forward to the day of his return. He's left nothing else out. He's left nothing out. Will we see it? Will we understand it? It will only come to us if we understand what he's already promised and given us in his word. And so if you're not a student of the word, if you say, well, it just goes over my head, I don't quite get it, I hope you're following someone that does know where they're going. Because you're going to get lost real quick. It's dark out there. It's confusing. The yanking people around in every which direction, just seeing how gullible people are. And sadly, they're becoming more and more injured and confused and embittered. And it's our job to know that the, the road that we're on is the one that leads to life. Though it may be narrow, it's the one that leads to life. Eternal life. And so they go to him and they insist, let's make this tomb secure because there's likely to be uh, some attempt by the disciples to steal the body and then claim that, see, meanwhile, the disciples, disciples weren't even working on such a plan because when Jesus shows up, they're like, oh, even Thomas is like, well, unless I could put my hand in your side and put my finger in the holes in your hand, I'm not going to believe. I mean, you think about the slowness of heart of so many, and it's true for my own, my own heart. My heart is slow to believe some of the things. When I hear something amazing God's done, I'm always quick to say, wait a minute, I've heard, that just sounds too good to be true. I don't know. That's our default these days. We cannot be slow of heart when it comes to the word of Jesus Christ because that's the only word that we can be sure is going to be fulfilled. So my point is, are we really listening to what Jesus says he will do? Are we really holding on to the promises that he's maybe given to our life? Are we fully aware? Or are we maybe less aware of the power of the promises than the enemy is? Verse 65 of chapter 27, so Pilate says to them, You have a guard. Go your way and make it as secure as you know how. Pilate's done playing. He's like, guys, you're the ones that are so concerned about this. You have a guard. You have a temple guard. You have soldiers. They're the ones that have been doing all the work so far, getting Jesus executed and arresting him in Gethsemane, and they've been working together with the Romans, and he says, you guys have all the equipment you need. If you're looking for approval, go ahead, make it as secure as you know how. And so they went, and they made the tomb secure. They sealed the stone, and they set the guard. And so Matthew 28, starting in verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. <laughs> That's just, yeah, so many ways we can look at that. A messenger of the Lord descends from heaven and comes and rolls back the stone from the door and sat on it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. <laughs> when God decides to move forward with a plan that he has said is going to happen, and he has said the way that it's going to happen, you can have all the, the enemy, the doubters, it doesn't matter who tries to set up a way of stopping or preventing it in any way, it doesn't make any difference. And I feel like for me as a believer and seeing the resistance that's coming against those who claim to be followers of Christ, and you can follow any other God, but if you follow Christ, you use a target on your back, and you begin to realize there's a reason for that, but no matter what they have to say, it really makes no difference how big their voice is, how many of them there are, how aggressive they are, whether they intend to feed us to coliseums full of people watching, whatever. They, it won't change the fact that Jesus' plan will be fulfilled in our lives and in eternity. It will be fulfilled because he said it will be fulfilled. And it doesn't matter what you try to do to stop it, it's going to happen. The question for us as believers is, will, be, will we be in sync and in step with the plan as it unfolds? Or are we going to be caught off guard the way that these guards were caught off guard and they thought they were all ready to be big and bad and keep disciples away, but they weren't prepared for a messenger from heaven. <laughs> they weren't quite prepared for that. God's doing some amazing things. It's not that God's going to do some amazing things. He's already doing them, but so many folks aren't aware of them because they're too busy. They're not looking where they need to look to see the miracle of each day that he gives us to share his truth with people. 
28, verse 5. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. I think it's pretty cool that the ones who were there to be with Jesus are still standing, but the ones that were there to make sure that they were going to stop God's plan, they shook so bad that they fell down like dead people. It doesn't say they died, but they, they, became, they passed out. They just couldn't take it. The women are still standing there, and, and this messenger begins to speak. He says, I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here, for he is risen. What's the next three words? As he said. You ever do I told you so with your kids? Oh, I try not to, but I do. I told you so. Wow, we've seen a thing or two, so we know a thing or two. And we kind of know what they're about to be doing is going to lead to a certain result. And they don't think so yet because they're still trying to understand how they don't know everything that they think they know. And they're still trying to teach us, to try to catch us up to what they've grasped so grandly in their minds. Just leave it there. He's risen as he said. I just think it's cool that the angel, hey, remember as he is, they were like, what? He said he was going to do it. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. That word is past tense. He lay down for a while, but he didn't stay there. I want to just look at the big picture for a minute, and then I'm going to read one of Paul's gospel messages. He preached the gospel to, in every letter that he wrote to any of the churches. And so if you've never read through Paul's letters, don't think of it as the Bible. Think of it as Paul's letters. He wrote letters the same way that you would write an email now. He used to write letters to people that he loved, to places where he had preached the gospel, and he wanted to follow up and give them some more information and just some more care and concern. And so he wrote them letters. And it's important to read through what, the, what we call the epistles in the Bible. They're short little books, but every one he preaches the gospel in some way again. And I want to read one of the ways that he preached it in Corinthians 15. But for now, I want to just look at big picture, let the Bible do some more talking. Big picture. In the beginning, God creates. It's the main reason that we're in the decline that we're in as America is because we removed that as the preliminary statement for every child that went into kindergarten in a government school. The first thing they learned was the Bible was God's word, and the first phrase of the Bible was in the beginning, and every student memorized that. It was just basic, duh, and that had to be eliminated, and so we did it through evolutionary theory and all these other ways and called it science and kind of spun it upside down the same way that they're doing everything. Now, the devil hasn't changed his tactics. It's just the gullibility of people don't require him to change them, unfortunately, and um, so he fin but he finishes his creation, and it says that on the seventh day he rested, and he looked at it all, and he said it was good. God didn't make a mistake in creation. Adam and Eve made the mistake when they violated what God had told them to do. I hope that this is going to make sense to somebody who maybe is just questioning, what's the difference between Christianity and any other form of meditation and prayer and belief system? This one is specific because it assigns everything that we see to a creator and to a moment in time when the creator acted and did what he did. Romans 5.18 says, Through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Part of the problem for us in many modern thought systems where there's a God if you want there to be, but if you don't want, don't worry about it. It's all kind of relevant to whatever a person believes. That belief system has allowed for a, several generations now to come to a place of not even really believing in judgment or believing in condemnation or believing in anything negative that's going to happen to them because they don't acknowledge through one man's offense, judgment came. There will be a judge of every life on planet earth. That is God's word, and you can't change it, and neither can I. As much as we might wish it away, we will all stand before a righteous and holy judge who will look at our life and will look for us to have a response. And if you have any response that you think is going to hold water in that moment, other than Jesus has done for me what I couldn't do for me, and I've received that gift, and I confess and accept him, that's your only way forward at the judgment seat of Christ. And he will know whether you're just having empty words or if you truly believe it and you've truly lived it. But that is the reality of every person that's born. We stand condemned because one man's offense, who? Adam, 
Judgment comes to all men because we're all born of that fallen seed. Results in condemnation. The verse goes on, but let's think about that for a minute. From the moment of Adam's sin forward, God's relating to humanity was just damage control from the sin that was birthed into humanity. Cain kills his brother in the first family. Adam and Eve's own offspring. There's murder in the first family on earth. It doesn't take long for evil to begin to, to, to grow and to become more and more evil. People look at some of the things that happen on the news like, oh, that's so shocking. How, how? Evil is progressive. Evil doesn't stop just because they ate the fruit. It wasn't just like, okay, now you guys are going to have to die. You can't eat the tree of life. And they were excluded from the garden and thorns and the curse came on earth. It was all terrible. But right, it gets to the point where by Noah, God says, this is such a mess. The only way forward is for there to be a flood that allows for this evil, this, just the pain and suffering of humanity under the curse to just be eliminated and to start again with Noah's family. We don't understand the place from which we've fallen. And we don't understand often the gravity of the fact that without Christ, we all stand before a judgment seat without the ability to claim that our sin debt has been paid. That there was someone whose own mouth promised me that it was finished as he hung on a cross in my place. So from the beginning, right through the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, they give a framework for peaceful coexistence. It's kind of like a band-aid on the sin issue. If you follow the Ten Commandments, it's, it allows for humanity to kind of get through this season while God is working on a redemptive plan that goes way beyond just dealing with the damage control of trying to keep sin from destroying culture and destroying families and destroying human value. So when Jesus says it's finished on the cross, what he's saying is that the corrective action against sin was fully covered by what he had just done. That there was no longer a need for God to just do damage control and try to keep us from killing each other and taking advantage of each other and living selfishly. But that season was finished because Jesus on the cross finished something which allows us to now move into a new season, and that's the proactive plan of redemptive living on this earth. It's no longer just hiding from sin. It's actually embracing the new life which lives above and beyond sin. That's why 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, 7, and verse 17 says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. There was a creation of old called Adam, and he failed. But Jesus comes and he says, if you come into Christ, you are now a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The reversing of the curse of sin and death, the ransom on the cross has been paid for all of us in full by Jesus Christ. But many of us don't understand the, the, the magnitude and the significance of where we were before him. It's too humbling to say, I need to be saved. And so many will try on their own. They will try to be good enough. They will try to attend church enough. They will try to give enough, live sacrificially enough. But you don't understand that the separation that came through the curse of sin can only be dealt with by what Jesus did on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus is inspiring the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit to write this. It says, For he made him who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us. That's past tense. From the curse. When did He do it? On the cross when He said it's finished. And it's applied to your life the moment you choose to believe it and to confess it. There's no waiting involved here. It's just a simple matter of when you choose to believe it. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Romans 5.18, we started this verse. Therefore, as, though, as through one man's offense, judgment comes to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift comes to all men, resulting in justification of life. That's a complete redemption. There's no room in there for your best effort and your best attempt. There's just the gospel of Jesus Christ, believe it or don't. We were bought back, redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There was no higher price. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, verse 17. He says, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, then conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, 
knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers. But you are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him might believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God, not in your ability. John 12, 24, Jesus begins to have a discussion with his disciples about the the impending doom of his own natural life on earth, but he begins to try to explain to them why it's essential and necessary. And I'm just going to read one verse out of this. This is in John 12, 24. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus referred to himself as that seed that would go into the ground and die. But when he came back to life, it was to produce a harvest that includes all of us to be able to have access to the place of standing before a righteous judge and being granted forgiveness and pardon from the sin that we were born into. I'm going to find a tissue. Thank you, ma'am. Jesus' whole point in what he accomplishes is that It wasn't just for him. It's for every single person who dares to believe it. John 14 says it very plainly in verse 19. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. You see the shared? If you can get your heart and your head And you're being around the fact that Jesus is alive. Because he lives, you can also live. If you're still dealing with this question of did Jesus really resurrect? Was he really made alive from the dead? Then it's never going to click in your own life because you have to start with the reality that Jesus rose from the dead. And because he lives, you will live also. We can read through scriptures that show us that through Jesus' taking back of the authority that the enemy had taken when Adam sinned in the garden, that he now has the right to share it with whoever he would like to. If you have all authority, that all authority includes you have a right and the authority to, to grant that authority to whoever you choose. That's part of what all authority means. He can delegate his authority. That's why Romans 8.37 says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because if he conquered the grave, guess what we get to do? Conquer the grave. Because he lives, guess what we get to do? Live also. (laughs) It's amazing. Because the enemy is fully aware of how things were and how they are now. And he would love nothing more than to convince us that it's actually all back to what it was before Jesus came. It really hasn't changed that much. And yet the reality is it's changed everything. There's no longer, God's no longer the God of just corrective behavior trying to curtail sin so that it doesn't get out of control. He is the God of a new creation miracle where the new creation nature can live above and beyond any other reality that it once knew and all things can truly become new. Jesus. I I, I was going to skip this. Let me read this. In Luke chapter 4, verse 6, you need to really get this. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? The devil says to him, all this authority I will give you and all the glory of this world for this has been delivered to me and I can give it to whomever I wish. He was trying to tempt Jesus into worshiping him and he said, I'll give you all the authority of this realm that you're standing up here looking at and Jesus never contested it at all. You think if that was a false statement that the devil made, Jesus would have said, hey, hey, you're stretching that too far, buddy. He doesn't correct the devil. The devil says, all authority I can give to you, and I can give it to whomever I wish. And Jesus just says, yeah. But then let's read Matthew 28. 
The devil understands spiritual authority, and so does Jesus. The question is, do we? Matthew 28, 19. This is after Jesus has resurrected. It's later on in the chapter. And Jesus comes to his disciples, and guess what he begins to talk to them about? Now, phew, you should have seen what I saw down there. You, you wouldn't believe how the devil looked when I walked into his room and took it. None of that. There's no anecdotal storytelling. He goes straight to the thing that matters most. And what do you think it is? Verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. (laughs) All authority has been given to me. What the devil offered him cheap, he paid full price for. Think about it. What does the devil offer us cheap? Success by the world's standards, promotion. But you just got to cheat a little bit and exaggerate a little bit and you know, lie a little bit and you can get ahead. This cutthroat world that we're trained that if you don't outcut the person next to you at a stoplight or wherever, <laughs> in line, whatever it is, it's just in human nature, folks. It's in all of us. We all want to be the person in front of us wherever we are. There's just something about getting ahead. It's part of the fallen nature. But the devil offered Jesus to try to shortcut this short circuit and make it seem easy. He's like, you don't have to go and do all that stuff that you're about to have to deal with. Just worship me and you can have it all. Of course, we know the devil's a liar and he could have given it to Jesus, but we know for a fact once Jesus had fall, if he had fallen in that moment, the devil was just because he's a liar. That's, when he lies, he speaks his native tongue. But it shows the reality that he had all authority until Jesus went to the cross. And when he said it was finished, guess what was finished? The full payment for every stain and curse that sin had ever left on this planet so that it could truly be brought back into his, under his authority. That's why Peter says you weren't redeemed with silver and gold and natural things. You were redeemed by the precious, priceless blood of the Lamb of God that allowed for all authority in heaven and on earth. This isn't a someday scripture. This is a now scripture. This means that right now when you walk around, you're not under someone else's control. You are under the authority of Christ. You are, by faith, the highest authority in your life. Your voice, your ability to believe, your ability to confess, you control the reality around your life because all authority was given to Jesus Christ. And you think I'm stretching it? Well, yes, because we didn't read the next verse yet. Verse 19 says, go therefore. Therefore means look at what I just said, and because of what I just said, now go. What did he just say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So now you go. And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and I'm with you always, even to the end of the very age. Why do we get to go and carry a message that we didn't hang on a cross to have? Because Jesus said we could. He gives it as a command, but I want you to think about it differently. I want you to think about it as, what right do you have to go and to pray for somebody to see God touch their life? What right do you have? You're just a human being. You have problems. You came to Christ. You needed a Savior the same as anybody else did. The only reason is because Jesus has said you can now do it because all authority was given to him. Again, did he rise from the dead? Does he now live? Then you can live also. Did all authority truly get given to Christ? Then then you can go and use it also because he says that you can. It's all about his word. I want to just read this out out of... out of paper as we conclude this morning. There's so many places we could read Stephen and his sermon. We could read Paul, Peter. Peter on the day of Pentecost. What a powerful sermon. I think I was going to read that one and then Carrie did such a beautiful job tying in some of the points she was making with that particular message on the day of Pentecost when he stands up and preaches and 3,000 people are cut to the heart by the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you could have chosen any place, but I chose 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says in just a few verses what preachers and teachers and 
authors have been taking hundreds of pages to say. And it really only takes a paragraph. And so we'll start right in verse 1. We'll have to jump ahead a little bit. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. The true message of the gospel is a gospel you can stand in, no matter what's going on around you. Verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And it's just in Paul's heart, in verse 3, he just can't help but retell it. Because it's so simple and it doesn't take any time to do it. And so he just re-preaches the gospel to them in just the next verse. You say, well, I don't know, I hear about this gospel. What is the gospel? Well, here it is. For I delivered to you first, uh, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. God said He would, and He did. And that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He was seen by, by Cephas and, then the, and by the twelve. And after that He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And he's writing to this church because they're already starting to wrestle with this idea. Did Christ really, like he was fully dead? Like he's sure he wasn't in some like blood loss induced coma? There wasn't some way that he somehow had a pulse that just was once every 60 seconds and it barely kept him. There's all these theories. They, they existed then and they're still here now because the enemy doesn't want us to understand the power of resurrection. He wants us to believe we can just be a little better than we were. He doesn't want us to believe we can be brand new from who we were. And in verse 12, it says, now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ isn't risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he did not raise up? If in fact the dead don't rise? For if the dead don't rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ isn't risen, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. There's more to life than the one that we see in the mirror. There is eternal life. The gift of God is not just a better life here. It includes a new life here, but it's eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you experience death and the grief of that, we don't mourn like those who have no hope because we know that there's a life He's prepared after this, that He went on ahead to prepare it in the heart of the Father for us. The ultimate message of the gospel is not just what it can do for your life now, the, the better finances and the better health and the better relationships. All these things are good, but they are not the point of the gospel. What happens when this life is over is the point of the gospel because this is temporary. The seeds here are temporary, but when they are planted as natural seeds, they don't come up as just natural seeds in the same way that Jesus was planted as a natural seed, but he comes up a supernatural spiritual being. Verse 20 says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. He's back preaching the gospel. He says the gospel in two verses, and now he just can't help but keep echoing it and saying it because sometimes we have to hear things more than once for it to get through our hearts and our heads that this is the truth. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and he's become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, meaning died. 
For since by man came death, by man, capital M, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ, the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his return. Verse 24, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God and the, God the Father, and when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. Listen to verse 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Let's jump over to verse 35. But someone will say, Paul's very good about reading the questions of his audience. But someone's going to say, how are the dead raised up? Like, really, like scientifically, like, explain to me, how is this going to happen? The body's already decayed. Like, we understand the natural because we live in the natural. But we don't understand the spiritual because without the Spirit's revelation, all we have is the natural five senses to understand life with. So many people are looking for purpose, and they're using their five senses to try to find it. You can't find your life's purpose with the five senses of the natural because your purpose is spiritual. It's beyond time. It's not just for now. It includes now, but it's not just for now. Someone's going to say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? What if people were cremated? What if they're buried at sea? What if they were burned up in, you know, a crash or whatever? Like how, we're going to try to figure out this spiritual eternal life thing with just five senses. And Paul's saying, listen, he called, listen to what he says in verse 36. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Folks, we understand it. It's gardening time. It's time to put seeds in the ground that you could cook and eat. But when you put that pea in the ground, a whole plant's going to come from that pea. Not just the one little pea you were going to eat, but a whole plant with flowers and leaves and roots. A whole entity from the seed comes a whole new reality that you can't see from looking at that seed. You can just see the seed. And he said a seed has to die so that it can live. And what you sow, you don't sow that body that shall be but just a piece of grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as He pleases. What's my body going to look like? Whatever God wants it to look like. It's going to be way better than the one that looks at me in the mirror now. That one's missing a lot of hair on top of his head. (laughs) And it's getting worse. (laughs) but God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body all flesh is not the same flesh but there's one kind of flesh of men another of beasts another of fish another of birds there are celestial bodies terrestrial bodies but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon. See, the sun actually creates light. The moon just reflects light. Two totally different things, but they're both being used the way God wants them to, to shine the glory that he chooses for that body. Another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory or light. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. There was no weaker piece of meat than Jesus' body as he said it's finished on the cross. He'd been whipped and beaten and bled out and been poked with a spear. All his fluids ran on the ground. There was no ability of that body to produce anything glorious. And yet, what do we see when he begins to speak to his disciples? And they're all just like, man, our hearts are burning within us because we know something about this reality that we're talking to. It's what we were created for, too. There's something in all of us. Eternity lives in our heart. There's a desire in us that knows we're created more than just for the nine to five, than just for battling through and fighting through and trying to break into the next thing that this life seems to put in front of us. There's more to it than that. It's the eternal reality of what we were truly created for, to be with him forever. There's a natural body, but there's also a spiritual body, says in verse 44. It's sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual one. And verse 45, so it's written... The first man became a, life give, a, a living being, but the last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man of the earth made of dust, the second man is the Lord from heaven. 
And as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. When we see God moving supernaturally in our bodies and our realities and we see miracles happen, we see this element of heaven coming to earth and touching earth and changing and proving that he is still God. But we still face a moment when this seed will get planted in the ground. This is not his intention to preserve this forever. This seed is going to go in the ground and it's going to die. But what it comes up as will be whatever God pleases it to be. Flesh and blood cannot inherit this eternal reality. Because I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. This is not a surprise to God. He's planned this all along. The saying that was written, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, oh death, where is your sting? Oh Hades, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Woo! That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to go find another one, you help yourself, but you won't find the power of the resurrection life at work in your reality. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you this morning for making it simple for us. We thank you that you just simply did what you said you would do, and within that simple act, one righteous man's act, we have now been liberated transformed we've been given new eternal existence not just changes now but you've promised that the place you've gone to prepare for us you said that if it weren't so you wouldn't have told us you wouldn't tease us with a place called heaven if it wasn't real lord you're the good shepherd you would never lead us down a path that leads us to anything other than your presence. Good shepherd, we ask you this morning, we believe all of us to the degree that we can, but there's still a part of us that requires your help. Lord, would you help us this morning with our unbelief? We humbly ask, Father, for even if we try to conjure up enough belief to believe, that's still a work of the flesh, and you're not asking us to do that. You're asking us all to believe with the measure of faith we've been given. And from that place, Lord, we recognize humbly that we need your help to believe. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to just embrace this truth called resurrection. Because you are not a one, you're not a God that lies to us and teases us, but you are the truth, the way in the life. God, we come this morning humbled by the simplicity of this message that a child can believe and receive. God, may we bring it back to simple basics in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. That as you've commanded us to simply love one another and by so doing, we would fulfill all that was written by Moses 
just by loving one another and by loving you. Lord, help us to let it be simple again. Help us to just lay aside all of our fears and doubts and concerns and what will it look like and what will it cost and just realize you've already paid the cost for it all. To simply embrace by faith the good gift, the perfect gift that came down from our Heavenly Father when you were sent. Jesus, you were sent and you obeyed. And you didn't take the easy way. You didn't cut a deal with the devil. You went to that cross and you suffered and you died and you were brutalized for me, for every person in this room who would dare to believe that you love them, you desire to know them and to have fellowship with them, to redeem them from the curse and to give them the brand new life that you've prepared for them. Jesus, we thank you for just letting us shine today with your glory as we leave here that even when we're unaware, there would be a sense that you're just radiating from us, that the glory of what we anticipate as death itself is swallowed up in victory at the last trumpet, that we could radiate even before that moment with the life that already lives within us, the life of the risen Savior, the life of the risen Messiah who saved but continues to save. Jesus, we thank you for having our eyes opened, our ears opened to be able to hear your voice and to see the way that you would have us to walk. We thank you for many, Lord, that would come to a simple faith in you because of the simple message that you died for us and that your Father raised you from the dead so that we could truly be saved. We bless your name, Jesus, and we thank you for your presence here with us and that you go from this place with us for your glory. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you'd like prayer, if you would like prayer this morning, you can come to the front of this room. We have a prayer team here to pray with you. Otherwise, greet somebody. And have a blessed Resurrection Sunday.